So we can start. So I will introduce Felix, okay? If you want to. Yeah, we cannot see you here. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, hi, everyone. So, uh, so I will introduce briefly Felix. So Felix is originally from Bonn, Germany. He completed his studies in uh, astrophysics at the University uh, of Bonn in 2016. Uh, and then he literally moved across the door to, to start his uh, PhD. Uh, at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in the DBI group. Uh, there, under the supervision of Professor Eduardo Ross and uh, Andrei Lobanov, uh, he learned how to process and space VLBI data, uh, a really non-trivial but cutting-edge technique in uh, radio astronomy, uh, which Felix is going to, to talk us uh, about in a minute. And, um, in particular, he focused uh, his attention on uh, a space VLBI study of the Parsec case jet in the famous quasar 3C345. Uh, then, uh, uh, after completing his PhD in uh, 2021, uh, he moved to Ireland at the University College of Cork, uh, where he worked for one year as a lecturer teaching uh, undergraduate physics and astrophysics courses, uh, while expanding also the research on uh, radio polarimetric studies of uh, JET in uh, Aegean, uh, and collaborating with uh, Dr. Denise Gabusta there. And um, I think that's all. So finally, I, I want to say that I'm really happy that uh, uh, Felix uh, decided to join uh, me and my group for the exciting and newly born project uh, SMILE. And uh, Felix is uh, since October is uh, formally a postdoctoral uh, researcher here with us at the uh, Institute of Astrophysics. So that's it. I think the, the floor is, uh, is first. Yeah. So you have the time. Yeah, yeah, I'll just we'll look at the time myself. Um, thank you, Carolina, for that nice introduction. Um, yeah, I started here in October working fully on the SMILE project, which uh, I will not be talking about today because probably or you know some of that, but I'm only talking about generally what I'm interested uh, in in research, what I did before, mm -hmm. and it mostly consists of high resolution radio observations of jets and active galactic nuclei. So mainly observing them with very long baseline interferometry <laughs> or short VLBI. And here's already one one picture of this uh, nice source that I've been observing with space VLBI uh, during my PhD. But first, to give a general idea of AGN, so I hope you can see it well with this cut off uh, pictures. So you see that um, different kind of peculiar objects were observed uh, in the universe. For example, this archetypical radio galaxy Cygnus A, which shows this like very bright uh, spot here in the center, and then this radio jets extending up to mega parsec scales in this case, and ending in this like, really beautiful radio lobes. And what we think, what objects like this and other objects uh, are powering this kind of massive uh, large scale jets and also the radio lobes here is uh, accretion onto a supermassive black hole, what we term the central engine. It consists of different parts, and I could probably fill the whole talk just talking about any part of this, but I want to highlight mostly observations of this jet, which is observed in about 10% or so of uh, these, uh, these AGM. But we still don't know a lot about these jets in terms of how they are launched and how they are collimated on, uh, on the small scales that we see here and how they're collimated, uh, especially up to kiloparsec and megaparsec uh, scales. So there are two main mechanisms which have been proposed decades ago by clever theoreticians about how these jets could be launched either from the equation disk, for example, or uh, even, uh, even by the rotating magnetosphere of the black hole itself, which would result in uh, kind of differently shaped jets, which you could mainly distinguish in their um, how narrow or, um, or broad they are close to the jet, uh, jet base. Naturally, these mechanisms are not really mutually exclusive. Both could be at play or something else entirely that we don't know yet, really. So there is a whole host of active galactic nuclei out there, and I cannot uh, in this talk talk about 
every one of them, but here is a sketch of all these different uh, observational um, the types of objects um, that are all unified in this, what we call unified steam uh, powering, uh, which are all believed to be powered by the creation of the supermassive black hole in the center. And it's surrounded by a dusty porous, which obscures our view um, depending on how we look at it. And this results in different types of uh, AGN being observed on the sky. And for me, the most interesting type of object are blazars, which is this subcategory over here, which is then again subdivided in via luck objects and flat, flat spectrum mm -hmm. blazars, which the main differentiation between those is uh, how powerful they are. These uh, quasars are more often observed at high redshift because of their high power, they can be observed to uh, much higher redshifts, while uh, via luck objects named after their progenitor source, via luck, um, generally have uh, are low powered sources. But the, what they share in common is that our viewing angle is very closely aligned to the direction of the radio jet that we observe. And that means that the emission is highly. Uh, relativistically boosted, which makes them uh, appear much brighter and often uh, times one side jets that are observed. Um, but that makes it then easier to detect. But on the other hand, it makes it more difficult to um, get the intrinsic jet parameters. These blazers are, although I'm focusing more on the radio part, are very much a uh, um, br uh, bright over the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, for example, on the left here, I show um, um, the Fermi gamma ray sky, where you can mostly see, see the galactic plane here. But all of these bright spots that you can see outside of the galactic plane are basically blazars that are gamma ray bright. And here are just some uh, jets on parsec scales that were observed within the Mojave project with the very long uh, baseline array. And so this is just the kind of object that I'm focusing my research on. So what we're observing in the radio is mainly synchrotron radiation from relativistic particles that are gyrating in a magnetic field. So because of the spectrum, we know that the synchrotron radiation is there. And we know that magnetic fields must be present. Um, the question is, of course, how are these magnetic fields structured? So it's a lot of uh, jet formation mechanisms, which, which you could already see in the jet launching um, slide I saw it earlier, um, a lot of them predict sort of a helical structure because the magnetic field lines are moved up by the rotation either in the recretion flow or around the black hole. And that is why all of these predict these kind of helical magnetic field structures, but they are kind of elusive to trace um, because of the small scales involved and also because naturally projection effects might still play a role here. This uh, plot here depicts uh, how we think um, the jet progresses as a function of gravitational radii starting at the black hole, um, <clears throat> where in the first um, uh, from, from 100 to 1000 gravitational radii, the jet accelerates and also collimates when we can start to observe it at millimeter wavelength and going to higher radio frequencies, we can observe it further outwards where we um, oftentimes observe shocks and superluminal uh, knots in the jet. So if we want to observe the magnetic fields and jets in general at a uh, very high resolution, we have to either decrease lambda or increase the, uh, the baseline or like <coughs> size basically and our instrument of choice for this is very long baseline interferometry that naturally extends your um, the effective size of a telescope um, to the size of the earth basically and not and even beyond that as i will show in a minute so basic is that a question so basically you can um synthesize a telescope with interferometry um, which has the effective resolution, but not the sensitivity of a telescope uh, with the uh, as, with the size as the maximum baselines between telescopes. 
And this picture just shows different VLBI arrays um, across, across the globe. Okay, how can we actually use these observations to probe and get the fields at the small scales? Uh, one is to use these high resolution observations in polarization. So in general, um, circuitron radiation from this kind of object is polarized and uh, to a degree that I will talk about in a minute. But in general, you can use this to trace the electric vector on the sky even with these observations, which will then be for the optically thin case at least, be perpendicular to the magnetic field that gave rise to the radiation based on synchrotron theory. And this gives you basically the 2D projected magnetic field morphology on the sky. Another way to deduce the magnetic field strength is actually by studying what we call the core shift. Since the jet, as it propagates from the central engine outwards, um, expands, it will also decrease in, uh, in particle density and magnetic field strength, and so the opacity will also change. And since the opacity is generally frequency dependent, we will observe the apparent jet base at different frequencies uh, at different positions on the sky. While this can also complicate your research by making alignment of maps at different frequencies uh, quite difficult, it can also actually be used by when you are able to measure this core shift accurately, you can also infer the radial magnetic, uh, magnetic field strength uh, along the jet. And with some assumptions, you can also infer the particle density. Okay, so just as a reminder, the synchrotron spectrum basically originates from a power law electron uh, distribution. Okay, I'm saying electrons um, because they are mostly responsible for the radiation that we see, although it's not completely ruled out that protons will also contribute to some degree. Um, so the spectrum, the typical synchrotron spectrum is shown here where the optically thick case is about due to five uh, halves. And then it falls off with some power law index alpha that is related to this uh, electron distribution a power law index. And in general, synchrotron radiation is highly polarized, which depends uh, to some degree on the spectra index and would reach a maximum of about 70% or typ for typical values um, of alpha. In reality, of course, this depends how uniform the magnetic field actually is. It might have a lot of random turbulent components that will depolarize your signal. And there are also some other observational effects that can actually depolarize um, this a lot. So in general, what you observe is not the full 70%, but in general, lower than that. OK, this is for the 2D projection on the sky. For the magnetic field, what you can also do is use um, in, uh, another effect that would actually give you some estimate of the 3D structure of the magnetic field. So for that, we use Faraday rotation. When you have a magnetic field line of sight component and there's electromagnetic polar linearly polarized radiation passing through it, it will actually change the apparent polarization angle. And this can also complicate your research, but it can also be used to study magnetic, uh, the magnetic field along the line of sight. So this rotation is proportional to the wavelength squared, as well as what we call the rotation measure, which in, includes the electron density along the line of sight, as well as the magnetic field component and the size of the uh, region where the um, radiation passes through. So naturally this parameters are uh, quite degenerate, so you cannot necessarily infer the magnetic field strength from this, but from the direction and still of the magnitude, you can get some estimates of what is happening with the magnetic field, which is, for example, what you can see in, yeah, it's again 3C345, my favorite source, although at much lower resolution than uh, the observation that I'm going to show. Um, but you can, for example, trace is if you look at how the rotation measure measured across the jet, changes across the jet. And if there's a significant gradient there, it will give you a hint at some toroidal magnetic field component. So toroidal meaning it's sort of 
um, wraps around the jet. This is kind of direction we with uh, with toroidal, and this is one of the components that you need to have helical magnetic fields. Um, yes, so the core shift can actually be used to not only estimate the magnetic field strength, but it can also be used um, to estimate actually the distance from technically from the core to the sonic point of the jet. But since this distance is much larger than the one from the sonic point to the central engine, we can actually use it as a proxy to estimate the distance to the central engine, which can also be done with core shift measurements. In general, the magnetic field strength will depend um, in this in this power to the uh, three quarters on the uh, uh, measured separation. So we can actually induce the magnetic field strength if we assume that the jet is conically and adiabatically expanding, and there's some equipartition between particle and magnetic energy, which is a criterion that is often um, often induced because it is quite close to the minimum energy uh, requirement, um, also based on circuiton theory. OK, what can we potentially do with that? So this plot here shows uh, both theoretical predictions as well as PLBI measurements of the magnetic field strength mm -hmm. uh, as a function of uh, yeah, the, um, the distance to the central engine. I put that here in both rotation radii as well as here in parsec for some generic black hole mass. So the measurements of PLBI you can see on the down right, while they can normally be uh, measured up to about uh, this scale here when you go to frequencies of maybe about 20 to gigahertz. Theoretical predictions, uh, though, differ, start to differ quite a lot when you go further to the central engine. So in the past, theoreticians believed that um, magnetic field lines could not really anchor to the event horizon of the, um, of the supermassive black hole. So these early estimates were differentiating between um, a black hole launched and an accretion disk launched jet, although now these um, views have changed a little. But what we can still trace with this is these predictions are basically from Accretion disk dominated magnetic fields around the supermassive black hole. But you could differentiate clearly between that and some black hole mimicker that would be um, a basic a magnetic rotator with a dipole magnetic field, which would have a much higher magnetic field strength close to the event horizon. So, so the higher point is blamed for snake and the lower one is blamed for pain. More, more or less, that's what uh, theoreticians used to think. But nowadays, uh, this corresponds rather to um, rather to a, a black hole mimicker, since people now think that the um, magnetic field lines can actually anchor to the black hole event horizon. So um, yeah, in, back in where the theoretical studies were made, this was people thought they could differentiate, but probably we cannot. But still, we can uh, distinguish between these and black hole mimickers. Okay, the uh, space field of the item was already mentioned. So the natural extension, if you want to even have even higher resolution than a telescope that has the size of the whole Earth, would be to go to space. And two missions uh, in that regard have already happened. So there was, there was the VSOP, the VLBI Space Observatory Program uh, that ran until 2003, run uh, uh, from Japan. And there was the Radio Astro mission where I am involved in too, which ended in 2019 when the spacecraft unfortunately stopped responding to our signals. But still, we have a lot of data available on a lot of AGN uh, from this unique observatory that, um, compared to VSOP, can observe in full polarization, which will be very important, as well as um, a very highly elliptical orbit, which uh, the major axis of which. Um, spans almost the distance to the moon, which would give you at the highest of possible frequencies of 22 gigahertz up to uh, yeah, a few micro arc second resolution. One good example of this is again the uh, progenitor source of the BLAC class, the object BLAC, which has been observed 
with radioastron in the paper published by Gomez et al. 2016, which shows this basically this very high resolution uh, core region with um, up to 21 micro arc second resolution, which is uh, one of the highest up to date. And you can use this high resolution at the radioastron frequencies and observations with ground arrays at higher frequencies that are then comparable in resolution to obtain rotation measure maps. And in this case, it uh, showed that this uh, rotation, um, that the EVPAs corrected for the rotation measure have um, a centroid in the core region, as well as a gradient that is apparently observed perpendicular to the jet direction. And both of these together really hint at that there's a helical magnetic field present in this source. Another example of um, an AGNS 3C84, which is the central galaxy of the Perseus cluster, and it's situated at quite low redshift. So although the viewing angle is not so as well constrained as for other sources, because it's so nearby, it can still be used to um, uniquely trace very small linear scales. And what is uniquely observed in this source is this very cylindrical jet profile. So before I was talking about conical expansion, there are jets which uh, have a parabolic expansion profile, but cylindric is uh, rather surprising, especially when you go down to uh, the linear scales that we observe here, because at the apparent jet base, the jet has already a width of about 250 rotation radii, when you are 350 rotation radii, uh, radii away from the, uh, from the core. And this plot here shows basically um, the expansion, the expansion profile in linear scales for different combinations of viewing angles and black holes, because they are both um, not as tightly constrained, but you can still see that they deviate clearly from here, a parabolic, parabolic trend in gray and the conical trend um, in black. And since the jet is already so broad, so close uh, to the, um, so close to the central engine, this is one hint that this actually launched from the accretion disk. So this cylindrical jet profile has been um, has been tried to explain with um, the fact that probably this jet, while expanding into the ISM, created some cavity with a uniform pressure, and this could actually then result in this kind of more collimated profile without the jet expanding too much. And this kind of um, so uniform pressure environment has actually been observed recently with radio astron, where at 4.8 gigahertz, this sort of low intensity cocoon was uh, observed around um, around the source. Here again, the image at 22 gigahertz, which uh, is kind of exciting. And I will talk more about jet collimation profile uh, a bit later. Um, some other highlights from the radio astron mission. There's this paper by Vega Garcia in 2020, where they could observe um, the jet on very long scales at 1.6 gigahertz, uh, which enabled them to use this um, to use the jet ridge line to trace Kevin Helmholtz instabilities in the source in the wave and body mode. And uh, studying this, they could constrain both the Mach number as well as the um, then put an upper limit on the density ratio of the jet to the ambient beam. There's another study, for example, in, um, in this source uh, by Kravchenko et al. in 2020, where I hope you can see it on, you see this like this very bent jet structure, which is only really been, uh, can only really be observed when you go to uh, the high radio astron uh, frequencies. Okay, now a bit more to the work that I did. I worked on the uh, Quasar 3645 at a bit higher redshift than the sources, than some of the sources that I just showed. This is just here showing uh, the kiloparticle scale emission as well as the X ray emission of the source, but we are really zooming into uh, the, the very center of uh, this galaxy with um, resolution that is unprecedented at this frequency for the source. So we reach about 300 micro arc seconds. Uh, so this is at 1.6 gigahertz. So for that, it's quite good um, along the jet direction and a bit lower 
transverse to the jet direction. So this basically compares the uh, ground away observations with the uh, with what we obtain when we include the space baselines to our data. CCP45 is also um, a quite variable source, which you can see here, um, where it has been observed over many years with the overall telescope. And our observations were at um, more or less a peak period in uh, 2016. So when we observe uh, the source like this, we also computed a jet bridge line, which we didn't use for tracing Kevin Hamilton stabilities because they were probably not valid on these scales. But um, so you can, but you can see clearly that uh, there's like um, kind of really jet structure, which might be due to uh, different factors. It, uh, it's also a candidate for a binary black hole, which uh, has been uh, tried to be modeled in the past. So of course, uh, it gets more interesting when we observe it in polarization. So what we see in the source, interestingly, is that the jet base is not the brightest feature, which is namely this feature here, which is also very bright in polarization. And it seems that these electric vector position angles are mostly aligned with the, with the jet direction. These uh, crossed circles here are our model fit, or sorry, Gaussian model fits to the visibility data directly. So the core here appears mostly self-absorbed. And uh, this is something that is not cannot be seen when you observe only with the ground away because all this will be blended into, uh, into one feature. Here on the right, you see how depolarized the core, actually, the core region actually is compared to uh, more downstream features um, of the jet. Compared to that, when we look at our 15.3 uh, gigahertz data, which actually have a similar resolution than our radio astron data, uh, you would see that the core is not as, uh, as depolarized. And yeah, as you expect, sort of in this case, you have a very bright uh, polarized feature also in, in the core region. Okay, one question that has arisen while studying AGN in the past decades is how or is there a limit on the brightness temperature? So, on the compactness of uh, features that one uh, can observe. And um, in the past, people have um, uh, thought that probably the equipartition brightness temperature would actually give a good limit on what we normally observe in AGN. Uh, but in fact, Radio Astron is an instrument that can uniquely probe very high brightness temperatures because the brightness temperature will be proportional to lambda squared, as well as the um, emitting, of course, flux density and also size of the emitting region. So that means this high resolution that is uniquely offered by radio astron at low frequencies can uniquely trace high brightness temperatures, uh, probably um, if they are there in the jet. And the take actually been seen in quite a lot of sources that we have brightness temperatures that are way in excess of 10 to the 13 Kelvin. And if you look at Doppler factors in the source, which basically uh, give you the correction for the relativistic beaming effects, uh, even then, they are above what we term the inverse Compton limit. So the inverse Compton limit is basically summarized in this in this formula, where you would basically have like an inverse Compton catastrophe when you would go to much higher um, brightness temperatures than ten to the twelve uh, ten to the twelve Kelvin. Um, in our source here, we studied the brightness temperature both estimating them more conservatively from the visibilities themselves, as well as from our Gaussian model fits, which always have like some systematic uncertainties. But from both, we get that the maximum brightness temperature, uh, the minimum brightness temperature that we estimate in this case is still higher than the inverse Compton limit. So this would uh, hint at the fact that there's actually, at least in parts of the jet, there's not an equipartition between particles and magnetic energy. Um, we also studied the, the spectrum in the source. 
because our um, 15 gigahertz data have a very comparable resolution to our 1.6 gigahertz data, it was very uh, nice that we can put compute a spectral index map both based on both of these frequencies, which um, couldn't have been done before. So we had to align the maps as I said earlier, so we used for that a 2D cross correlation algorithm, which basically cross correlates the optically thin emission region in the jet, which is supposedly not changing its position with frequency. Using that to align the maps, which is only possible because we have some extended emission that we see, we can trace the uh, spectral index along the jet. So we have an optically thick jet base, as we expect, that also declines along the jet. But we actually see an increase of the spectral index, some slight transverse symmetry um, that is almost spot on on the uh, total intensity peak and even more spot on with the polarization peak, which I do not show here in this map, um, but here along this, uh, along this slice, uh, this vertical horizontal slice here, it shows that it's actually there. And this would favor that there's a shock actually traveling down the jet, which um, would also be favored because we have magnetic field lines that are quenched perpendicular to the uh, to the jet direction. Sorry, what is I am in? I is in. Ah, sorry. Density? Alpha is the spectral index. I is the total intensity, yeah. and P is the uh, polarized intensity. And you're saying that this favors shock in, uh, in which the, what is the configuration of the magnetic field that you... So the direction of the magnetic field is, why is this? So it's, of course, not exact, but... Uh, so now along the, the jet direction. So, the, so this is the EVPAs, are the, sorry. This are the EVPAs, so the magnetic field will be perpendicular. Although, although this picture might uh, change based on what I would say later. So we tried to uh, find if there are any uh, components moving in that direction, which would favor such a scenario. But we could not uniquely identify a component in the Mojave 15 gigahertz data that would correspond to one of these components that we see uh, at 1.6 gigahertz. So there were two candidates. But there is no conclusive evidence for that that we have. Um, so there's component um, 23 here, which actually rises somewhat in, uh, in brightness temperature uh, following our observations. But uh, it's, it's not a clear case, unfortunately. So we also studied the core shift <laughs> using maps at different frequencies. So we have maps at 15 gigahertz, 1.6. Um, radio astron, but we also have maps at 43, 4.8, and 8 gigahertz. And we use that also to study uh, the core shift in the source, which uh, showed um, some interesting behavior because we um, see if we include all data points also at 1.6 gigahertz, we see that we get a quite high value of this KR parameter. This KR parameter is uh, the one <clears throat> which uh, where the core shift is proportional to the new frequency over minus one over KR. And this is related to the spectral index as well as how magnetic field and uh, particle density decrease along, uh, along the jet direction. And this is a quite high value. So we fitted the data also without, which yielded a fit that is more uh, consistent with KR equals one, KR equals one would equal to equal partition. Mm -hmm. So likely this, this, the core shift is underestimated at 1.6 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. so it could mean that likely we misidentified the core, that there's still some blending with an, uh, with an upstream feature, which is still something that is uh, under consideration um, what is happening here. But similar th things have actually been observed also with the VSOP. Um, or by did not did not have the same kind of resolution as radio astron. So we also study the rotation measure in the source using the same alignment uh, that we got from our spectral index maps. Um, again, this is how the apparent rotation of the um, vector vector position angle will depend on the frequency or wavelength. And 
it has been quite kind of difficult to use all different frequencies that we have to estimate the rotation measure because we don't have significant polarization in every region in all of these maps. It is very much favorable to have a lot, as much frequency coverage as possible, also to uh, get rid of the amb uh, ambiguity in um, because you can rotate the EVPAs by 180 degrees basically without changing anything. So this kind of ambiguity would show in this kind of uh, fits for the rotation measure where you could just down or upscale these data points by 180 degrees. If you have a lot of frequencies, these kind of rotations become increasingly uh, unlikely, though, although they can never be ruled out completely. But still we get uh, nice fits from using the three lowest frequencies with radio astro. Where here I overplot the rotation measure um, map that we obtained together with the EVPA corrected, um, the rotation measure corrected EVPAs on top, top of the total intensity map. And this actually shows um, that the magnetic field might actually not be as perpendicular to the, um, to the jet direction uh, as we thought. So maybe this, this could still be that this doesn't trace a shock, but for example, we could still see some, uh, some of the outer parts of the jet where the um, magnetic field is more colloidal. It's, this is still uh, yeah, work in progress. They're still trying to figure it out and um, to model this accurately. Okay, you cannot only go to space to increase your resolution, but you can also just decrease your observing wavelength, which is a much more budget-friendly solution, but it has uh, some, some drawbacks and some advantages more. So you can potentially probe deeper into the jet because the opacity is much lower. And, but on the other hand, you will have more noise contributions from the atmosphere, especially from the troposphere. And you have a more limited number of telescopes that can actually observe at these high frequencies. And those are generally weaker millimeter wavelength. And the less there's the um, global millimeter the I array, which uh, of some of the some of the nice results that could be obtained with it, I will just want to, to highlight now. So basically, this is again the famous source sickness A, and then you can sort of zoom in more and more, um, going to higher and higher frequencies where you end up with uh, this nice map at three millimeter, which is the observing wavelength of the GMBA or sickness A, which here in the near scale corresponds to a few light years or parsecs. Potentially you can reach uh, also micro arc second resolution, sorry, with the GMVA. So one of, one of the highlights I think is uh, this survey result um, where uh, about 160 compact AGN have been, uh, have been mapped with the GMVA. A lot of these detected for the first time. So they actually, this serves as a nice database uh, to use now. And one of, the, uh, one of the major results from it is that if you calculate the brightness temperature in the source frame and plot it against uh, the, the frequency in source frame, where, like I said, higher frequency observation probe reads closer to the jet, uh, to, the, um, to the central engine, you see that there's actually a decrease in brightness temperature along the jet. And that means that jets apparently start to be more magnetically dominated when you go closer to the jet, um, closer to the central engine, which is what we think is happening in the acceleration and collimation law. Another study where uh, they did a cross correlation between gamma ray emission and radio emission in the source Texas 2013, which is the gamma ray bright one, together with very high resolution DMVA maps where they could trace components being ejected from, uh, from the core region. They could trace actually the, uh, the location of the gamma ray emission, which is still one of, the, uh, one of the mysteries. There are studies that show that it's in sources quite far away from, uh, from the central engine, but in this case, it's uh, located about one parsec from the jet apex. And so what uh, probably happens here is that um, 
photons from the broad line region or from the dusty tors get um, get inverse Compton scattered, which will then lead to this gamma ray emission in this case. At least. So I already talked about collimation profiles, which is I think which is one of the strengths of one can, what one can do with uh, the GMBA, because you if you want to trace the collimation profile of the jets, you naturally have to go to higher frequencies to trace them closer and closer to the central engine. And this has been done in more and more sources. On the right side, I showed an example of M87, which is one of the best studied sources that we know, um, especially observed with the Event Horizon Telescope recently, which is this small data point here. But it has also been observed at uh, with the GMBA at higher frequencies, which we could really constrain that the jet is actually um, at first following a more parabolic profile and then um, starting to have a more conical shape, which means it's really expanding. And this transition in M87 happens at about the Bondi radius. And the Bondi radius is sort of the um, the radius around the black hole where accretion can happen. When you um, look at this equation where you basically set the escape velocity of, um, um, of the black hole to the sound speed, then you get this estimate of the, of the Bondi radius, which then depends on the properties of the, um, of the ambient medium. But not in all cases, this has been so clear that the Bondi radius is actually um, associated with this transition in jet profile. So, um, here in a study by Bocardi et al, it shows that in one case it's clearly again at the point of the Bondi radius, but in another sort, the Bondi radius is orders of magnitude larger than where you start to see this apparent transition. So it's also again not a very clear case, but we need more objects to be observed and the collimation profile studied. So here's just another study uh, by our very own Carolina on uh, again the luck is also a well-studied source where they studied the collimation profile using different frequencies and using stacked images over many epochs to really trace the overall collimation profile in the jet, which shows interestingly that you have um, a more conical expansion at the start of the jet and also further outwards, but there is some increased uh, expansion in between. And this could also be related to, um, to the Bondi radius, which is um, about at this range. And then you have the, the jet expanding further and then forming a recollimation shock um, further downwards where the jet then expands um, uh, again more conically. This study is not done with the GMBA, but it's done with the um, at lower frequencies, but it shows our need for more high frequency observations. So in very nearby AGN, COVA uh, 2020 used um, uh, studies at uh, 1.4 and 15 gigahertz to trace the jet collimation profile. Also in 10, about 10 sources uh, seeing um, this kind of transition between parabolic and conical jet profile. And they attribute that to uh, the transition point between where there's pointing energy flux dominating and when there's kinetic energy flux dominating in the jet. But for higher redshift sources, this cannot be done without going to higher frequencies to probe um, the jets on much, um, much smaller linear scales. OK, now we go to even higher frequencies, namely to the event horizon telescope. And I just want to highlight the work that I've been involved the most with, which is getting the polarization structure of um, this famous uh, this famous ring that we see here. So this is the group. In 2019, uh, we met actually in Bonn for this workshop to really, um, really get, get the science going and this these two papers have then been published in 2021 after a lot of effort by a lot of people. So I already mentioned M87 a few times, but this is how it looks like in the optical. This is the first jet that has ever been observed, not, with, not in this way with the Hubble Space Telescope here, but it has already been observed in 1917, about more than 100 years ago. 
And since then, it has piqued the interest of people. And it has been observed with the HT because the expected uh, resolution of the black hole shadow on the sky would match the resolution that you could get with an array at 20, 230 yards. And here it just shows the, um, how it evolves at different frequencies. You have armor observations here, 43 gigahertz observations here, and this is finally the uh, polarized ring. Um, showing this wind plots where again, this kind of wind, windy structure are the EVPAs that you observe here and not the magnetic field directly because the EVPAs are the observable. So not only uh, M87 has been studied, but also quite recently is Sagittarius A star. So you might have seen this image or these images um, where these images here are not different dates, but they correspond to um, different um, uh, categories of images which can be categorized as a ring and only a small fraction that could not be categorized as a ring. Also, not only um, the colors have directly been observed, but also uh, AGN jets, for example, the 3C279 by Kim et al, where they see a very broad uh, jet base or a very spatially uh, bent jet that could only be observed with the EHT at such high frequencies. So how would we obtain this polarization image? So in general, these EHT images are probably the most well vetted um, deforming, Im deforming, Im uh, deformetric images to date. Um, so in all cases, different imaging methods are used and um, a lot of synthetic data to sort of make sure that your imaging algorithm working well are being used and it always takes quite a while. But what this shows is that the imaging methods here, when you look at the polarization degree and also the, um, the EVPAs, that in this, uh, in this bright spot, they agree very well on where that is situated and on the uh, value of the EVPAs. So we are quite sure uh, about that. Just to give an impression on the, the kind of work that has been done to, um, to get this kind of image. But what we really see is that you have in the northwest, uh, in the southwest, sorry, you have this uh, sort of bright polarized uh, feature here with EVPAs that seem to be um, quite as as mutual. But then we compared that with theoretical works where um, different scenarios of toroidal, radial, or even vertical magnetic field have been tested with. Bottom shows linear, uh, <clears throat> sorry, not linear, analytic, analytic approaches and numerical simulations. Um, and tested were scenarios of accretion uh, flows where we tested both magnetically arrested disk and standard and normal evolutions, so MAT and SAME. So astronomers are always very, uh, um, very creative when it comes to acronyms, but MAT means mostly that there's a uh, dynamically important uh, magnetic field and it has this more asymmetrical component, while SAIN has more uh, turbulent magnetic field and more of a radial component. And to parameterize this, uh, the image, we use this, um, this beta 2 parameter, which basically summarizes in its amplitude and phase how the uh, magnetic field is distributed around uh, the ring. So if it's either more asymmetrical or more radial. And this is encompassed in this parameter very like, conveniently. Also, uh, models with different black hole parameters, um, black hole spin parameters were tested, and also if it's retrograde or, or prograde. The um, temperature of the uh, ions and electrons has this used, used this uh, R high, R low uh, parameterization. Um, I'm just showing this because these parameters have been uh, have been varied um, in the models to uh, see if they fit the data. So in total, about seventy two thousand model images have been tested, and this just shows uh, a variety of them. I think that uh, this looks pretty nice. Different black hole whip spins, viewing angles, nets, uh, and stains have been tested, and this is uh, a broad summary of. Uh, of the results of some of the parameters. So on the bottom, you see that from 
all these models have been tested against the amplitude and phase of this beta 2 parameter, as well as the uh, net linear and also net circular polarization, which is coming from ARMA observations. And in, if you take all of these parameters together, not a lot of models survive this, and especially uh, you know, the same models do not survive it. In total, you see only a handful of models actually survive the more tight polarization constraints compared to the total intensity constraints. Although, if you compare some of the parameters, the jet power, for example, which is a part of the model, although we don't see it in the HT image, we do have other observations of the M87 jet. Um, it's not much better constrained with polarimetry, but the accretion rate is better, is actually much better constrained now if you use polarimetry in the range of 3 to 20 times 10 to the 4 solar masses per year, which is about 10 times 10 to the minus 5 of the um, Eddington uh, accretion. And the magnetic field is about 1 to 30 Gauss in the good constraint at this range. Uh, this plot here just shows um, uh, uh, exam is an exemplary um, snapshots, um, 600 snapshots of uh, three failing and three uh, surviving models um, to highlight sort of which ones are actually surviving, where um, MET, MET is really favored and in principle, not shown here, but we can say that M87 is rotating, although we don't know exactly in what fashion. Okay, just the as, the as the last part of my talk, also the topic of my PhD, I will talk about how we can actually um, trace the magnetic field closer to the central engine in AGN jets without having to rely on this sort of uh, difficult alignment of images. So I already showed you um, that estimating the core shift is not necessarily easy, especially um, when your alignment or the, your uh, determination of the core position of the jet base is not um, is not so accurate. But there are ways to circumvent that when you use phase referencing observations. So I think this is probably the slide with the most equations. I'm sorry about that. But uh, in general, the um, yeah, I will, I, will be, I will be short with this last, last part. Just uh, the message to, to wrap up. So yeah, you can use phase reference observations where you basically can get rid of atmospheric contributions by observing your target source together with uh, a, a reference source in with interleaving observations. You can normally only do that until the frequency is about 22 gigahertz, which is um, the problem when you want to trace the, um, the core shift to even uh, closer to the jet base. The problem is the atmosphere. And for this case, um, it has been a technique has been developed that uh, is called frequency phase transfer, where you would try to observe at multiple frequencies simultaneously in order to correct the higher frequency uh, terms with the lower frequency ones, because the atmospheric terms depend on the frequency in this way. If your frequencies have an integer ratio, you can actually use that to correct this. And this is shown by a study here where you see. Uh, basically the phase as a, a function of time, which would be all over the place if you didn't correct them uh, in this way. But in this way, you can act effectively increase the coherence time uh, by a lot. So this kind of studies have been done on very small baselines with the Korean API network, which only has baselines of a maximum 500 uh, kilometers. And the great thing about this technique, if you combine the frequency phase transfer with the phase referencing observations, that you can get a much higher positional accuracy um, with the core shift, which depends on both the beam size and the SNR of your faces. And the SNR of your faces is basically really what is limited at millimeter wavelength. And in order to reduce that, we use the frequency phase transfer, 
And we propose for observations in our case that use not only the KVN, but also the Yebis telescope in Spain, effectively increasing the um, the beam, uh, the um, so sort of reducing the beam side by an order of magnitude, and thus will we potentially obtain a much higher positional accuracy that we see here, which will enable much much more uh, accurate portion measurements, and so we can trace start to trace this um, like difference distinguish between different scenarios if we go to potentially 120 nanometers. Um, I think in the interest of time, I will try to wrap up. So we had to fridge test with these observations. Unfortunately, we did have, uh, we did take a long time to calibrate them and image them, but we didn't uh, get a signal at 43 gigahertz. So since this observation mode is pretty new, we still have a lot of problems with the um, with the ob uh, observing mode. And there's some problems still with the receiver that we are trying at, uh, to figure out at this moment. Um, but I think this has potential to um, be very important in the future. As a brief outlook, it's not only possible to go to millimeter or space, um, it is also possible to combine both, which is what is planned with the millimetron observatory, which will observe at millimeter wavelength and is um, thought so one of the plans is to have it orbiting at the Lagrange point too, which will yield very, very, very uh, good resolution, about uh, a few hundreds of a micro arc second potentially with this kind of telescope. And one simulation showed that if you take this kind of still blurry M87 image by the EHT, and then you look at it with an EHT combined with such a millimeter observatory, you could really go down to observe the optical photo ring around the black hole, which is very and a very exciting prospect. And not only that, people are also extending the uh, EHT to be to the next generation EHT, which will include more telescopes, because one of the drawbacks of the event horizon telescope is its uh, poor UV coverage. So increasing the UV coverage and also having more intermediate and short baselines would uh, enable us to not only observe the accretion flow around the black hole, but also potentially jet at the same time, which was missing in the first M87 image. Okay, let me just wrap up here and give you my summary. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. So I think uh, because because we are running a bit late, maybe if there are any questions online, we can take one question and then you guys have to, uh, you can continue the discussion in the, in the seminar room. Any questions online? I don't see anything. So in that case, I will, uh, Stop the streaming now, and then you can continue the discussion okay. uh, in person. Okay, thank you very much, Felix. Thank you, everyone, for joining. See you next week. Yeah, thank you.